Today, January 1st, is the Feast of the Circumcision, the octave day of our Lord's birth. The readings for the octave day of the Nativity, the circumcision of our Lord, the epistles taken from <clears throat> St. Paul's letter to Titus, which is also the same epistle taken from the first Mass of Christmas, which would be a midnight Mass. Dearly beloved, the grace of God our Savior hath appeared to all men, instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly and justly and godly in this world looking for the blessed hope and coming of the glory of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and might cleanse to himself a people acceptable, a pursuer of good works. These things speak and exhort in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. <coughs> the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is taken from St. Luke, chapter 2. At that time, after eight days were accomplished, that the child should be circumcised. His name was called Jesus, which was called by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Please be seated. So a couple of announcements, I consider them important, dear faithful. First, the blessing of the children. I would like to bless the children who are present after Mass, so I will go back to take off my vestments and then come back here. And as soon as the prayers of Thanksgiving are done, we'll bless the children. This is normally done on the Feast of the Holy Innocents, but of course we didn't have Mass here that day, and so we're going to do this blessing now. What's the importance of such a blessing? Just that, to keep them innocent. To protect them. My desire is to protect them spiritually and physically with the blessings of Holy Mother Church. There's a potluck after Mass for this Feast of the Circumcision, and so I thank all who helped make this possible, especially the Stam family. Thank you for bringing a main meal dish or some kind of potluck dish. I thank you very much for that. It's a good time for us to socialize on this first of the year. Tomorrow is the Feast of the Holy Name. So it will be the Mass of the Holy Name, and that will be 4 p.m. here. So a usual Sunday schedule, confessions beforehand, and then the 4 p.m. Mass. I would ask your prayers for Reverend Mr. Hugo. Uh, he's going to be ordained this coming week on the 6th, the Feast of Saint of, well, of the Epiphany, uh, the Little Christmas as we call it, and he and two others. So it should be two young men joining him for ordination because they are all out of the usual rhythm or schedule, meaning that these two other young men were normally ordained to be ordained in Australia, but since they have now been moved to the Virginia Seminary, they're at Dillwyn, St. Thomas Aquinas Seminary, then they also have been waiting for ordination. So they combined for these young men to be ordained on this Feast of Epiphany. So please pray for Reverend Mr. Hilko and the two others that will be ordained with him. And then also pray for the sick of our mission or parishes, and also pray for the priests to keep up their strength. More, just recently, two days ago, Father Greg Gonzalez had a stroke, and so he is debilitated quite seriously in the hospital, and we can't afford that, I'm sorry to say. Um, we cannot lose any priests, and to lose another priest, even though Father has been weakened as time has gone on, I've noticed that he's getting weaker. And Father Pauly saw him at the retreat in Ridgefield and said he was quite, quite um, sickly looking. So I guess it was a matter of time before something finally seriously caught up with him. But hopefully they can address these health issues that he has, and we pray for his safe recovery because he's not a very elderly man. He's uh, I think barely 60 now, perhaps, and so he's certainly would have a lot more years of priesthood ahead of him, but his health has really taken him down. So let's pray for his good health. Uh, of course, he was out in Florida working with Father Bernois in Sanford. He would take care of a mission south of there. I believe it's south, but anyway, another mission he would take care of from that priory of Sanford. 
So imagine them scrambling. They were scrambling the other day, the district, to find a priest to cover that mission. I don't know what happened with that. And even all of us find us priests, if we're sick one day or sick, happen to be sick on a Sunday, well, there goes the Sunday Mass because we don't have somebody to cover for us. We're very short on priests, and even these three priests being ordained, that's like a little drop in the bucket, which you're hardly going to be able to notice. Because they just need to fill in and take care of things that are already waiting for them. Work that's already waiting for them. So we need a draft. I think we should do a draft of young men. We need lots more young men in the seminary. It's going to take uh, seven years for them to get through, so many people will never have a priest before they die. But at least in the future, we'll have lots of priests. If we get a lot of generous young men standing around saying, what do I do with myself? I know what they should do with themselves. Become a priest. If there's ever a more militant time to need priests for the military of God itself. There's no waiting around or goofing around. I, mean, I will say the same thing repeatedly now as the weeks go on. And I'm all about the draft for young men to go to the seminary to see at least if they have a vocation. What better thing could they do in this crisis? What better thing than to lay down one's life for his friends? All his interests, saying, Father, I understand, Jesus, I understand, I'm putting away all my interests because we need priests. We need to have young men become pastors of souls to harvest. And I see in Southern California such a great harvest ready, but not the workers. Not the workers. And of course, yeah, just keep up your prayers for all of those who are most need, whether they be sick or those who are wayward. Uh, wayward from grace, wayward from our families who need our prayers for conversion. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Dear server, dear faithful, on this holy day, I wish to speak to you about a couple maybe helpful um, questions and answers on this feast, but also I don't want to forget to say something about the Epiphany, since that falls in the middle of the week. So same idea. What are these important feasts? Why does Holy Mother Church give them to us? And what should we be doing? And then a little more instruction <clears throat> on the attitude of this new year, 2022. We want it to be a year of grace. And so I have some things to say about that. Our conduct, our responsibility, and getting away from hedonism. So first in the circumcision, what is this feast? Well, the circumcision of our Lord is the feast instituted to commemorate the blood shed by Jesus in the first days of his life. Blood that was shed that was sufficient to redeem us all. We must believe that. It is that powerful, the blood of our Lord. And of course, the spirit by which, an attitude by which God shed this blood is for the good of men. And I don't want to forget to remind you that our Lord very his very presence in the womb of Our Lady, the Incarnation, and his very presence at the birth is all beginning this sacrifice. So everything he does is a sacrifice. We must not forget that. And here, on this feast, it's even shedding his blood. Where do we find out about this, this ritual of the circumcision? Why? In the ancient law, circumcision was a rite instituted by God to distinguish those who belonged to his people from the infidel. And we hear about this with Abraham, with Abraham. So I'm going to read to you a scripture quote. It's from chapter 17 of Genesis. And it was when our Lord sets the covenant with Abraham. And he says, this is my covenant, which shall, you shall observe between me and you, and thy seed after thee. All male kind of you shall be circumcised. And the infant, like our Lord, of eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man shall in your generation. He that is born in the house, as well as the bought servant, shall be circumcised. And whoever is not of your stock. And my covenant shall be in your flesh, for a perpetual covenant. So there it is. Chapter 17 of Genesis. The words of our Lord God to Abraham. 
And so certainly our Lord fulfills that today. He didn't see himself above the law. You'll notice in the life of our Lord that he submits himself to the things that are good. As an example, he goes through with them, as Our Lady did with the presentation of February 2nd. They submit themselves to these rules that God has established for the good example, to teach others this is good. Now, did it mean that circumcision would continue on as a sign of spiritual baptism forever? No. But at the moment, it was not what God's plan to overturn it, but simply submit himself in all humility. Was Jesus Christ subject to the law of circumcision? No. He was a true son of God, giver of the law, and of perfect holiness. He was certainly not subject to the law, which was meant for God's servants and for sinners. Why did Jesus Christ then wish to be submitted to it? Why, why did he so humbly bow down to such a law? He wished to be submitted to this ritual without being obliged to do so. Because having taken our sins upon himself, because of his love for us, he wanted to take the punishment due to our sins and to begin redeeming them by his blood from the very first days of his life. So what happened when he was circumcised? He was given the name of Jesus. That was the moment, of course, that the name was given to the child, which we know is given already by the angel to the parents. It's already foretold. What does his name mean? Savior. It means Jesus. Jesus means Savior. So, of course, tomorrow's feast will emphasize that name, the respect that's due to the name of Jesus because of who he is, our divine Redeemer, God made man. So, according to the spirit of the church, there are four things that we should do to celebrate this feast of the circumcision, this octave day. We should adore our Lord, Jesus Christ, and thank him. So many things we have to be grateful for, especially in this past year of 2021. And we must love him. So, adoration, thanksgiving, and love, an act of charity. And then we must invoke his name with great respect and true faith. Put all our trust in him. So already, our action on this feast day is one of faith, hope, and charity. And even thanksgiving. That should be our spirit. It's a spirit that keeps us away from so much harm. It keeps us zeroed in on what is important. Also practice spiritual circumcision, which consists in removing all sins and unruly affections from your heart. Yes, that's very apparent to us. We commit our sins, but there's also this unruly affection, passions we call them, inclinations. that are always warring against us. We need to excise them. We need to take them and throw them away. In this year 2020, let us do that. Get rid of all our unruly affections. There are many things around us that help us to do that. If it's not getting sick, it may be also dealing with certain persons. It also may be in certain situations that we didn't ask for. It's a good way to get rid of our unruly affections. We should be watching for these moments of virtue and grace all around us. God gives us the ample needs for our perfection. But sometimes we're so blind and sometimes so unwilling that we pass many years without perfecting ourselves. And all the treasures are right in front of our nose. All the things to make us good and perfect. And then lastly, to consecrate to God the whole year. Think of a way to consecrate this year to God. Could be a simple little consecration. Could be just your words that you say before our Lord, the child Jesus, whichever. With the help of his grace, we hope to spend it. Spend this year in his service. What can you do for Jesus on this feast day and going forward? Just a quick note on the Feast of the Epiphany, which comes up in the middle of the week. And that is, what, what should we do on the solemn Feast of the Wise Men, which really commemorates many different mysteries? First, the adoration of the wise men. Second, the baptism of our Lord. And then thirdly, the miracle of the wedding feast at Cana. It's all commemorated up right on Epiphany. It's true, there's another feast day of the baptism of our Lord, which comes just a week later. That would have been like an octave day of Epiphany. But normally, Epiphany is just that, Epiphania. It's a manifestation, a revealing of what? Of Jesus to the Gentiles. This is really the Goyen Street feast day. 
all of those who are not Jews and chosen people, this is really their feast day. This is when God went out to contact all of those souls he wished to save, revealing himself to them. So keep that in mind. Study this feast day. And don't forget, on the following weekend, we can easily bless um, chalk, if you haven't done it before. We can bless the chalk. We can bless the... Uh, we can even bless chalk tomorrow, but I have to bring some with me. Um, and anyway, in any, different sun, any of these different Sundays, we should bless chalk. We should bless the uh, incense, if you wish. Plenty of which I have to bless up in Arcadia for the year of sung masses and benedictions. And then even gold. We know, we should know already what they represent. They represent just what's going to happen to our Lord, what he is. Divinity, this adoration we owe him, his royalty, and his death. All represented in the gifts of the wise men. So what can we do? To celebrate that feast solemnly, you first can pray for the priest being ordained. It's a great day. What a gift that is to men. What a revelation to the world around us, a priest being ordained. That's the first thing, is pray for the priest. And then secondly, to recognize in the vocation of these wise men, we call them kings, the first Gentiles who are called to the knowledge of Jesus. In the beginnings of our own vocation. Whether it be our vocation as Catholics in the faith, or maybe it's another vocation, a vocation in the religious life, from the priestly life. We don't know. Sometimes we may be waiting for three kings to come along to tell us what we should do with our life. But maybe it's already come. Maybe it's coming. Maybe it's in the process. It doesn't have to be three kings dressed up like kings or carrying gifts. It could be that grandparent who encourages us that priest who knows maybe it's a good confession that we made or a retreat that we went on that we made we also want to pray to god to extend the great gift of faith to those who are deprived of it we want converts we want people to convert we want people to come to the faith and that's a great day to pray for that epiphany the feast of epiphany is just that a revelation we want this revelation to go universally across the world we also want to awaken, really stimulate this love of Jesus Christ in our souls. To follow the divine inspiration promptly. What's he telling us to do? Do it. Don't wait. Offer him like the wise men some tribute of your devotion. How are we going to do that? Alms. We already said prayer. And maybe Christian mortification. And that will follow us through the whole year. If we're thinking that way, what can I give Jesus like the wise men? I will already be thinking of prayer, alms, and mortification throughout the year. It's not just done once at Lent, or once a little bit at Advent, or once maybe at the Ember Day. No, it's a disposition of a Catholic. Give alms, pray, and do a little mortification. It helps us so much to perfect our souls, it could be a way of making a good resolution for the year. Oh, I know there's all kinds of different resolutions people make which hardly bear any fruit. We should pick things that the church does. Those will bear fruit. So, lastly, I wish to speak to you about the spirit that I would like to see us have, that I would like you to have. Um, first, let's speak about conduct. Conduct is so important we look at babies and it's hard for us to look if we have two babies side by side it would be hard for us to say this is the good baby and this is the bad baby normally don't talk that way babies are just good i mean they may be pagans and totally baptized but they're still just babies they haven't done anything they don't have any character of their own to act with they're just growing they're going to be Grace is going to be put into them, people talking to them and dealing with them builds up character and eventually we'll start to see what they do. They'll make rational acts. We'll see who they become. So babies are not, neither good or bad. But with men or women, we can look at them and say whether they're good or bad. So what happens? What's different? What happened? That's the whole question of grace and reason, right? The whole question of what we're exposed to, what people taught us what kind of character was being developed. So I want you to think about that in this year 2022. What's our conduct like? Now, 
we all, a lot of us here are adults, we're, we're sort of stuck in our conduct, but I think we can improve. We can always improve getting away with putting away the bad and the, the evil and the faults. Our conduct can always improve, but think about your conduct around others, especially young people, especially children. They're just growing and learning, and our conduct around them must be such that we make a better generation following us. So think of that conduct. Think how it is that many of us are being judged on whether good or bad by our conduct and improve. Improve, especially as an example to others. Look at the Catholics of today. The Catholics and their Catholic conduct means so much to the world. I remember when I was a boy, and my mother would tell us stories about how when she was a child, she, she was a non Catholic, because she was a convert later in life, she would be around Catholic boys. And some of the things that she would tell me that they would do were hardly Catholic boys. They were just acting like pagans. And her father, who was a non-Catholic at that time, also says, oh, yeah, just do like the Grimms do. And he said to us when we were little boys, um, yeah, we'll just eat the meat on Friday and go to confession on Sunday. I said, Grandpa, well, we're less than 10 years old. I said, Grandpa, that's not the way it works. You don't just sin and then go to confession on Sunday. <laughs> wow, cheap. Even we knew that, little boys. But that's the way his thinking was, because that's what the Grimm boys did. Those Catholic families that he hung out with. God bless him, he had some kind of Catholic influence. My grandpa had died without the faith. But, yes, that means so much. A Catholic's example, especially a Catholic family, with children, it's so powerful to those around you, either for good or for bad. What about responsibility this year? Responsibility, that's a very important second to conduct because obviously how we conduct ourselves in our responsibilities, our duties is very important. And I was reading in a very good book of a Jesuit, um, explaining the different attitudes, and virtues, and such of men. So pretty much weighing up the morality and reason of what they do. And the second thing he mentions is responsibility, conduct and responsibility. So what are we going to do this year to be more responsible? Standing up for our duty, taking care of our duty, not balking or moving away and saying, oh, I can't do that, or that's too much for me. No. You know, it, it, whatever God has given to us is not too much for us. He gives us the grace. Yes, we must be very careful of taking upon ourselves responsibilities that God didn't give the grace for. That would be our fault. But there's many things he asks us to do, and we're so hesitant to be responsible with it. Teach your children responsibility. So oftentimes now I find that parents are doing everything, and the little children kind of wander around as the king and queen, well, wait a minute, they should be having responsibility. As a young child, the child needs responsibility, otherwise it won't be able to handle responsibility later on. And remember, the one who learns to be obedient and take responsibility early can take on more in life, and God gives more. People who trust that person give more. I remember it's true in my own life. When my parents could trust me with little things, and they gave me more and more. Otherwise, why would they have trusted me? I had to prove myself. And my responsibilities. And God is doing that constantly with us. He sees what we can handle. He sees what we're capable of. What we're able to move. By his grace. We want to move towards him. He gives us the grace. We move towards him. And he keeps doing that. And he gives us more and more responsibility. As he knows we're capable. Without being presumptuous. We must not be presumptuous on our part. There are many responsibilities that come to us. I know all of you have received responsibilities from God that you didn't expect. But he wants you to bear them. He wants you to take them. Because his grace is sufficient for us. We must do that in a spirit of joy. The last thing would be hedonism. We live in a hedonistic world. And it don't, we should not be fooled by that. It, and it doesn't mean always just impurity. It just means this philosophy of always pleasuring. Always the providing pleasure. We have to have pleasure, pleasure, pleasure all the time. It's a very hedonistic way of thinking. It's a philosophy, a way of thinking that the, some of the early philosophers 
So no problem with that because they were pagans. And even in our United States, there have been authors who, well, one of them coming from Russia and then becoming an author here, uh, they promoted such a title as selfishness is a virtue. Wow. Pushing selfishness. That's what pleasure ultimately, if taken to the wrong, does. It just creates a selfish person. And we have to watch out for that this year. There are plenty of selfish people, selfish environments around us. We have to watch out for the hedonism. Because you know what hedonism ultimately leads to? Ultimitarianism. It leads to the world and governments always providing that, always seeking that. That's nothing about supernatural or nothing about anything outside the material. And I only have to look around a little bit, and I'm so sometimes shocked to look around even a little bit at the world around us and seeing how it's all geared towards pleasure. If it's not the onslaught of gaming all the time, or of impurities and videos and movies, or bulletin boards, or who knows what, it's always about pleasure. Keep the man in his pleasures. He doesn't think when he's involved in these pleasures and hedonism. He doesn't think about God like he should. He's constantly caught in that cycle. What can I get next out of life? What can I get to satisfy myself? It's terrible. It's hardly the gentleman or the thinker that God wants to go to heaven or to guide others. It's so important. The devil knows this. Don't get caught in his traps of hedonism. He wants us to get caught in this trap. Then we're not thinking about the high things, the reasonable things, the supernatural things, because we're just down here in this cycle. What can I get next? What can I get next? We're like a little dog. It just looks for its next meal. Be careful of that. You can study that on your own if you wish, the whole question of hedonism. There was a great book, I wish I could remember the full title, that a man, a teacher gave to me years ago called Something to Hedonism. Wow, it was revealing. This culture that we live in is meant to bring us down to our basest powers. Basest powers. Be like animals. Don't become an animal during this year, 2022. It must be a year of grace, a year of elevation, a year of becoming perfect. More perfect than we were before. So let us pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary for this grace. Let us honor our Lord and his divinity and uphold his sacrifices that he's made for us. Don't just expoon them, treat them like they're nothing. No, he spent a lot of effort in our redemption, a lot of effort in providing priests and the sacraments for us. We don't want to treat that cheaply. Otherwise, he'll take it away. Otherwise, we just won't have what we should have because we're not appreciative. Be careful. So pray to Our Lady that we never do that, that we remain just like her, kneeling at the crib, Nearly always focused on the king. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.